Open your Bibles this morning to Deuteronomy chapter 30. I must confess that I didn't quite get my sermon preparation for Acts 25 and 26 done this week. We were missing a day. I tried to make up for it, but still wasn't able to. It's a difficult passage, so pray for your pastor next week. I committed to not preach anything that I'm not clear on, and if I'm not clear on it, you won't be clear on it. I am clear on Deuteronomy chapter 30 this morning, so open your Bibles there as we discuss what the gospel really is, uh, very fitting for us as we also gather for baptisms a little later. Deuteronomy 30 is perhaps one of the most concise, compact passages that describe the true faith, or as we know it, Christianity. In 1981, so many, many years after Deuteronomy 30, the Christian author and philosopher Francis Schaeffer said this about Christianity. He said, Christianity is not a series of truths in the plural. Truth this, you have to believe this. It's not a series of truths in the plural. Rather, Christianity is truth spelled with a capital T and no S. Truth. Truth about total reality, not just about religious things. Biblical Christianity, he says, is truth concerning total reality. Now, we can extend that statement beyond 1981, all the way back to the time of Christ and all the way back to the Word of God spoken to Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 1. Christianity or the true faith is truth about everything. God is the only source of total truth for total reality. Only God can answer the question, what is the purpose of life? Why are we here? How does life actually work? Now, closing up those first five books of the Bible, Moses gives us everything that we need to live life successfully. Not only to answer that grand question, what is the purpose of life, but more personally, to give you and me an answer as to why we were even born and why today even matters in your life. In Deuteronomy 30, Moses kind of packs all of Genesis to Deuteronomy into one chapter. The book of Deuteronomy is a bit different to Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. It is, it's five big speeches, five big sermons from the aged Moses to this new generation of Israelites about to enter the promised land. Finally, the long-awaited time has come. They're ready to cross over the Jordan into God's promised land. This book then is the transition book. How do you go from 40 years of wandering in the desert for, as punishment for your sins into God's wonderful blessing? It's a book about the old, the past that is done, and it's a book about today as you look forward to the rest of your life. Deuteronomy is the aged prophet Moses' last attempt to instill truth into stubborn people. Four sermons, four speeches detailing total truth for them. Four speeches, though, that are not just filled with information. They are pushing you. They're nudging you. They're hurting you into a decision point. How will you continue from today? What do you need to set in order today so that the trajectory of your life and the rest of the reality that we experience is indeed God's trajectory? And chapter 27 to 30 is preaching on the purpose of life. And chapter 30 is this last kind of crescendo, perhaps the greatest chapter in the whole book. Now, some of these principles, as we read them, will be very unique to the covenant God made with Moses at Mount Sinai with the nation of Israel for life in the promised land. And there will be lots of things unique to that. But all these principles are still going to apply to us too. These, these, are, not, these are not out there, far-fetched, ancient kind of settings. The principles are easy for us to recognize. This 
is your starting step towards grasping God's total truth for all of your personal life. It's all or nothing kind of chapter. There are no shortcuts. There are no exceptions. There are no half-hearted measures. If you are in, you have to be all in. If you're out, you have to be all out. And so, if you're not going to be all in, to be really honest, you might as well leave now. I'll give you a moment. (laughs) If you're going to stay in, then let's read together Deuteronomy chapter 30. I'm reading out of the English Standard Version. You can just follow along as I read. Deuteronomy 30, verse 1, And when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God has driven you, and return to the Lord your God, you and your children, and obey His voice and all that I command you today with all your heart and with all your soul, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you, and He will gather you again from all the peoples where the Lord your God has scattered you. If your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there the Lord your God will gather you, and from there He will take you. And the Lord your God will bring you into the land that your fathers possessed, that you may possess it. And He will make you more prosperous and numerous than your fathers. And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring, so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, that you may live. The Lord your God will put all these curses on your foes and your enemies who persecuted you. And you shall again obey the voice of the Lord and keep all His commandments that I command you today. The Lord your God will make you abundantly prosperous in all the works of your hand, in the fruit of your womb, and in the fruit of your cattle, and in the fruit of your ground. For the Lord will again take delight in prospering you as He took delight in your fathers. When you obeyed the voice of the Lord your God to keep His commandments and His statutes that are written in this book of the law, when you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. For this commandment that I command you today is not too hard for you, neither is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, Who will send to heaven for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, Who will go over the sea for us and bring it to us that we may hear it and do it? But the word is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you can do it. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. If you obey the commandment of the Lord your God that I command you today by loving the Lord your God, by walking in His ways, by keeping His commandments and His statutes and His rules, then you shall live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you're entering to take possession of it. But if your heart turns away and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not live long in the land that you're going over the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying His voice, holding fast to Him, for He is your life and length of days, that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give them. It's a significant chapter, isn't it? You can picture this text, perhaps, for a sake of clarity, as five concentric circles to explain reality. Or perhaps more precisely, five um, concentric circles to explain the gospel. Because the gospel explains reality. And we, as we begin, are standing outside this first biggest circle, and we're going to work our way to the center, and at the center is where you need to make a decision. In our own wisdom, we tend to walk around blindly, and chapter 30 actually starts in verse 1 as this kind of distant look into Israel's future. You've been in the land, your fathers got it, then they disobeyed, and you were scattered, and what happens then? It's a result of walking in their own ways that sets the stage for the scene that, Paul's, that Moses is describing. 
We tend to walk blindly around the circles. We never actually make it to a circle. We maybe dip into two or three of the, the outside rings, and we kind of just live there or bounce out again. Moses is going to explain everything to us, nudging us carefully towards the center to make a decision. And then the decision is up to you, and whichever way you want to go, you can go, but he's going to make sure you actually make it. So with eyes wide open today, we can set aside all the perceptions we have of reality and life, and we can see clearly the real truth about reality. The first circle, then, on the very outside is the circle of knowledge. Knowledge of God and His Word. If you want to understand reality, you need to at least to stop your ignorance. At least learn something. In the preceding chapters, all the blessings for obedience and all the curses for disobedience are given. Chapter 29 ends with a disaster and exile that would come to the nation of Israel if they depart from the Lord, turn their back on Him, and say, we're not going to understand life your way. We're going to do it our way. And that's why verse 1 of chapter 30 says, when all these things come upon you, the blessings and the curse, which I've said before you, and you call them to mind among the nations. You've been driven out of the land already again, and there you remember. There you remember the things about God that you know. You call them to mind. Moses had just finished telling them that if they don't listen to God and His Word, then God will curse them and scatter them out of their land into all kinds of foreign lands. And sure enough, it happened later in Old Testament. But if in those foreign lands, in a current state of punishment, they call to mind, they put it back in their thinking, this speech, this speech back in their mind, and if they then act according to this speech, then God will bless them again. And God will instead judge their enemies instead of judging them. So this is the situation. This generation of people listening to this message are not the disobedient generation that he just hypothetically talked about. This is the faithful generation, the generation standing on the brink of the Jordan River, about to cross over into the Promised Land and experience finally the blessings of the Lord. But Moses has very intentionally and deliberately described them more often than not with this term throughout Deuteronomy, you stubborn and stiff-necked people. And he says, you're going to forget. I just know it. You're going to forget. And so his first kind of call to them is, call it to mind. Don't forget what God says about life. Call it to mind. If you want to avoid disaster and if you want to make sure you're living life as successfully as you can live it in a sin-cursed world, then call to mind what God says about life. Set your heart on knowing God's Word, the things that were preached and then written down by the prophets. Even though he quickly moves on to the second circle in verse 2, Moses actually has a lot more to say about exactly what they should call to mind. Jump down to verse 11. Verse 11 is almost kind of a restart to his, his little speech here. Verse 11, he says, For this commandment that I command you today, it's not too hard for you. It's not far off. It's not that you need some special escort to heaven to go get it, this whole heaven tourism genre of books that have come out. It's nonsense. You don't need that. You also don't have to look at the Mediterranean Sea, which was terrifying for them. Okay, they stuck to land, the, the Israelis did. You don't have to look at the Mediterranean Sea, the Great Sea, as they called it, and said, man, we need somebody bold enough to go across this thing to find us truth. It says, you have it. It is very near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart so that you can do it. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil. It's right in front of your face. And I can say that to you today too. I'm setting it right in front of you. 
Let's just keep in mind the statement that it is near you, it's in your mouth, in your heart, so that you can do it. It's not this mystical kind of inward look to find reality within you or some mystical nonsense like that. He makes it clear in the next verse, he says, it is in your heart and in your mouth because right now I'm placing it before you. It is outside of you, but thankfully in you too. You have taken what is outside and internalized it, not you've looked internally to find something. It's a reference to everything they just heard from Moses in the past set of sermons. In other words, it's all of Deuteronomy. The Word of God is not something that requires a special skill or insight from you. The Word of God is something that God and His great skill and insight has declared to you. You just have to accept it. Know it. It's not difficult to get hold of. It's rather easily accessible. It was easily heard that day. God literally wrote the Bible in the language of the people who lived at that time. You and I have it in our own possession. It's on your lap right now. You've got different versions on your phone. I'm sure you've got a few at home. You have God's Word, so you literally have the answers to life. You just need to assimilate that knowledge. Listen to God's self-revelation in His Word. Seek the knowledge contained in the Scriptures. It's like I say, the reason we preach verse by verse through the Bible is simply because there is another verse. God, I don't need to know what's in it to see if it's useful for me. It is useful for me because it's in the Bible. So just know it. Jump with both feet into the available and accessible knowledge of God. Ancient religious myths are filled with these hero stories, right? These legends who embarked on a quest to find truth about life, to find truth about eternal life, to find meaning and purpose for this life or that, that one thing, the flower or the pot of gold or whatever that would, would just solve all the problems in the world. These years have traveled across great seas, and according to the tales that are told by their adherents, at times they even ventured into heaven in their quest. Those stories are action-packed. They're dramatic. They captivate your imagination. They fill your mind and little boys' minds with heroism, mysticism, and fantasy. But none of these myths stand the test of truth, since neither true meaning for this life nor eternal life are ever found and kept by these heroes. It's just stories. And their intriguing element is the sensation around the storytelling, not the content of what they found. The Israelites came out of Egypt, a land full of stories like that, more so than any other perhaps. They were about to set on the promised land, a land surrounded by all kinds of mythical stories, all kinds of Canaanite religions. Would they be doomed to the same fantasies, ever hoping that the hero would find it and return before he dies a hundred times? Would they be doomed to similar fantasies, the nation of Israel? Are we doomed to similar fantasies, just kind of like pick your religion and hope for the best? Not at all. In these verses, Moses tells them and tells us that you are not doomed to figure it out for yourself. You're doomed if you figure it out for yourself, but you're not doomed to figure it out for yourself. It's readily accessible. Oh, it might not be very sensational and filled with heroism and, and dangers and seas and shipwrecks and dragons. It just means open your Bible and start reading. God's Word is life because God, who is the source of all life, revealed life to us in this way. God's Word is the user manual for life. It explains how life works. It explains everything you need to know to be successful in life. Oh, you can pick whatever profession you want and learn the skills of the trade. But if you want to be successful in life, you only need what's in the Scriptures. Covet the knowledge of God and His Word and learn to discern when something just, just meaningless, a cheap, superficial, fake alternative is presented in the terms of declarations and prophecies and visions of heaven and things like that. Covet the truth. 
Now, knowing God's Word is the outside circle, it's just the beginning point, though. We have to move to the smaller circles. We have to get to the middle eventually. Knowledge of God and His Word is not enough to live a successful life. There must also be a correct response to that knowledge. Okay, just getting a degree in theology isn't going to be sufficient for you. You're going to have to act upon that knowledge. The next circle then in this five circles is the circle of repentance. Repentance, complete biblical repentance. Now, very simply, repent means to turn around. It's, it's not a complex word in Old Testament. It means turning away from something and turning to something, a simple picture in our mind. Turning away from your way of living and your way of thinking and turning towards God's way of living for your life and God's way of thinking about your life. In the terms of Deuteronomy and the covenant with the nation of Israel, it means turning from disobedience and turning to obedience. Turning from that which brings curse to that which brings blessing. Turning from the way that leads to death and turning to the way that leads to life. The New Testament calls it repentance. The Old Testament just says return. <laughs> okay, turn around, turn and obey. You see it very clearly in verse 2. You call it to mind, verse 1, and then, verse 2, return to the Lord your God, you and your children, and obey His voice and all that I command you today, with all your heart and with all your soul. Turn and obey. Not just feel bad and hope for the best, not just kind of mumble under your breath that on January 1st you'll at least change a little bit again. Turn right away and obey instead. If you read the Bible to learn more, but never stop your ways and turn around and obey what you're reading, then you're not a true believer according to Moses. You're still one that's choosing death and not life. A good life is never paved merely by knowledge. A good life is never lined merely with good intentions. A good life is most certainly never gained through just a proud pouring out of Bible verses. It starts with this idea of call it to mind, and then it says, now return and obey. Repentance is more than just conviction and remorse, feeling badly about it. True biblical repentance always produces obedience. Oh, the conviction and remorse are very helpful in producing obedience, but in and of themselves, they are not repentance until it produces a turn. Now, Moses assumes here that the nation will not obey. He's got that on pretty good grounds, that assumption. It's not a bad assumption for you and me either. Okay, the world says, I'm sure you'll do fine. The reality is the opposite, isn't it? You leave somebody to their own devices, they never do fine. It's not rocket science. And so Moses fast forwards here to a time where you're inevitably going to disobey because that's what mankind always does. That's reality. To a time of punishment, and he says, there the Lord will bring you back to the promised land. After you have disobeyed, and if you then even repent, he will again bring you back. If you're in exile, it means you forgot God's word, and God is punishing you. But even if in that state you repent, God will forgive. Oh, you know what it's like. You sin and then you realize it and you feel so bad you don't want to repent because you don't really want to talk to God after disobeying Him so clearly. And finally you come to your senses and you confess your sins to the Lord and immediately you're forgiven. <laughs> Moses knows that when they feel, realize how much they've sinned, they're going to feel like not wanting to talk to God. And he says, actually, that's the right time to do so. And God will forgive. God will bring you back. Knowing the Word of God is important, and then it has to lead to repentance. Take that knowledge and say, wow, if I know God is holy, then I'm starting to realize I am not. If I know God said, thou shalt not do this, then I also realize I just did that. And so repent. We can skip verse 6 for now. Look at verse 7 again. The Lord your God will put on these, all these curses on your foes. Verse 8, you will again obey the voice of the Lord your God. 
Verse 9, the Lord will make you abundantly prosperous in the work of your hand, the fruit of your womb, the cattle, the ground even. Those are Mosaic covenant terms, saying if you are faithful, you're going to have a wonderful life because God is your king in the country. Verse 10, when you obey again the voice of the Lord your God to keep His commandments, when you turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. That's repentance. Obey, turn, return, and obey. God's Word is really readily accessible. Know it just because it's there. Be curious about it. And as you read the Scriptures, always ask yourself, is there something that I'm reading here, that I'm growing in my knowledge, that actually addresses a sin in my life or a, a false belief in my life? Ask yourself that. Not every passage is going to have something like that, because some passages are about God and His perfection. <laughs> You're certainly not going to find a sin to repent of in that list. But it's still a good question to ask every time before you close your Bible. Was there not perhaps something? Should I maybe stop talking a certain way? Should I stop thinking a certain way? Should I, should I start praying differently? Should I, should I spend my money on different things? What about my time, perhaps? Should I, should I um, make relationships with certain people differently? Is there something that needs to change? Is there something that I have to turn from so I can turn to something else? A test of a true believer is knowledge followed by repentance. Repentance without knowledge will never be true repentance. Knowledge without repentance isn't faith either. So resolve to study your Bible and resolve to repent regularly. Next, we enter the third circle. As we get closer and closer to the center, the third circle is the circle of love. Now, I need to make a distinction here because of our times. This love, actually all love in reality, but this love in particular is not that universal good feeling that you get because other people are nice to you and thoughtful of you. This very specifically is the love responsibility, which is what true love really is, a responsibility that you have towards another, in this case, towards God. The one who created you, sustained you every day, and is keeping you alive to hear messages like this. You have an obligation, a responsibility of love to God. The law of Moses has been stereotyped as a list of do's and don'ts, right? You know that stereotype. That's the furthest thing from the truth. Even when you get stuck in those passages that are the list of do's and don'ts, you still realize this is to produce love. It's like when you tell your kid, don't do this, don't do that, do this, do that. It's to produce a relationship of love. And the rules and regulations and commandments and endless lists and blessings and curses of the Mosaic law are all there to demonstrate you, to push you to a love for God. Because as you read the rules and regulations, you realize this God takes care of everything. I never need to wonder with Him what's right and wrong. All His laws are perfect. If you don't do all the don'ts and you do do all the do's, you'll literally have a perfect life. Now, tucked in the middle of this section, Moses attempts to get that love point to sink in one more time. He talked about turn and obey. In the middle of those two sections we read is verse 6. The Lord your God will bring, sorry, verse, uh, I was right, verse 6. The Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love. So that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul that you may live. You want life? Love God. You want to love God? Ask Him to change your heart. That's the verse in reverse. If you want life, love God. If you want to love God, ask Him to change your hearts. And we could add the previous two circles. If you want Him to change your heart, repent. If you want to repent, gain knowledge. This verse takes repentance a step further. It says, circumcise your hearts. 
uh, an odd concept to us, perhaps, circumcise your heart, without getting too imaginative with a strong word picture. It simply means do spiritually what circumcision does physically. Cut off and throw away. Cut off everything that stands before you and God and throw it away so it's never part of your life ever again. Repentance means to cut off everything that stands before you and God and throw it away, turn away from it, and turn to something completely different. Same term. Now, circumcise your heart is literally impossible. Caddy, where do you even start with that? The medical field isn't going to help you with that one. Pastors aren't going to help you with that one either. Uh, the, uh, uh, how do you actually circumcise? How do you do a very physical procedure to a spiritual reality? It's a spiritual act. It's an act that requires the work of God. Oh, a pastor can help you with us, not with a circumcision of your heart. God will have to do that. But a pastor can show you the one who can do it. And it's not going to be you. It's a command to them here. Circumcise your heart. And the point of this command is so that they will finally look at all the commands in the law of Moses and say, we can't. We just can't. We're not good enough. We don't know how to do this one. And that will drive them to love God, which will then drive them to live well. Circumcise your heart so that you will love the Lord your God. It's a directive to God. Fall in love with who He is and what He can do, and then you will live well. The real goal here is to love God. A purposeful life doesn't come from cleaning out the old sins and just kind of trying harder. A purposeful life comes from adopting a whole new love. True faith has always been about a person. Not a religion, not a system, not a law not a list of practices. It's about a person. If anything in the law of Moses, it's about a person. It's, it's the relationship with God based on knowledge and a recognition that you are not whatever you should be. And that the only way you can become something different is if you go to God and ask Him to do it. If you tie all these details together, be it for Mr. Israeli in 1400 BC or you in AD 2023, you must, everything in life is driving you to love the Lord your God. Oh, it's a great question to ask one another, by the way. You can ask unbelievers that too, for, the, for that matter. We have each other for, for coffee, dinner, whatever it might be. Ask, how did the events of the last week, good or bad, doesn't matter, how did they increase your love for God? Oh, that's, that, that'll make for good fellowship, won't it? Now, you might think this is the end because there's literally nothing better than that. And it's certainly the end as far as the significance of truth is concerned. But there are two circles left. Moses has a little more to say. Filled with the knowledge of God and His Word, made right with God through repentance, Sensing this growing love for this utterly unique God might make you feel that life has changed and I'm done, I'm, I'm set, I've got life made. But this is no self-help system. This is not just a list of steps, do them and you'll be saved. This is a matter of life or death. We're not just concerned about making you feel better for a day. We're concerned about eternal life and eternal death. Faith or apostasy, blessing for eternity or curse for eternity. And so we need to enter this fourth circle. Pause there for a moment so that we are ready then to enter into that little center circle. The fourth circle, right before the inner circle about total truth, about all of reality, this fourth circle is the circle of consideration. Or if I can put it this way, considering the cost. Moses does this frequently in his preaching. He tells you the gospel. He tells you the gospel, how wonderful it is, how amazing God is, how bad you are, but how wonderful God is in his forgiveness and how easy it is to believe. And then he says, but you can't. He always kind of pulls up the brake just before you're there. 
somewhat the exact opposite of modern evangelism and outreaches and, and missions work, right? It's just, go, go, go. Let's make sure everybody repents. We'll make them tired. I was literally part of an outreach once where the, the stated purpose was to us leaders, the, the, the small group leaders, was we're going to tire these kids out so much over three days so that by Sunday morning, when we partake in communion at camp, all of them will be ready to accept the Lord. That's not how Moses does it. Moses does the opposite. He says, wake up, open your Bible. We're going to talk about that. You need knowledge. Now repent, recognize that you need to love God with all your heart, and then pull back because you can't do it. <laughs> Consider the costs. Remember, Jesus evangelized that way too. He told the story of a man who had this great intentions to build this wonderful tower. But because he didn't first sit and calculate the costs, he started building it, couldn't complete. Because there are projects like that around our country. <laughs> okay, people who come and start something, there's houses like that in our suburb. They're not done because they ran out of money. They didn't count the cost up front. So Moses says, before you just say, oh, I love Jesus, I love God, count the costs. Verse 16. If you obey the commandment of the Lord your God that I command you today by loving the Lord your God, by walking in His ways, by keeping His commandments and His statutes and His rules, then you shall live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you're entering to take possession of it. Some very clear parallel concepts here. Look at them. To obey the commandment of the Lord your God is to love the Lord your God. You see that by obeying, you're going to be loving. To love your, the Lord your God is to walk in His ways. By loving, you are walking in His ways. By walking in His ways, you are keeping or guarding His instructions for life as this cherished gift that nobody can snatch from you. You see that? Obey, love, love, walk. Walk, guard, or keep. What Moses is saying is, you can't be selective here. You can't say, okay, I'm, I'm going to love God. Oh, I love God. But I'm not actually going to walk in His ways. Don't jump on the love bandwagon too quickly. Because the love bandwagon comes with a whole host of other things that you might not be willing to commit to. Take a moment to consider the cost. Will you accept all of God's commandments simply because He gave them and He said them, or will you reinterpret some of them and ignore some other ones and kind of just half do some of them as well? Will you believe how God works with mankind based on how He says, or will you debate or perhaps even resist or perhaps replace with your perception whatever He has so clearly revealed? You can take God and all His commandments and ways, or you can have none of Him. The cost is even higher, though, verse 17. If your heart turns away and you will not hear, but are drawn away to worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not live long in the land that you're going over the Jordan to enter and possess. You need to take it all, and if you say, I'm not taking it, then you will definitely perish. This is a right use, by the way, of our modern Christian fad of I declare. Okay, God declares. We don't declare. We have no authority in our words whatsoever. God declares, and He declares very clearly in this gospel presentation that if you do not accept all of them, you can have none of them, and then you will perish. You will need to kick out all your own ways of things out of the way so that God and His ways are the only things left. So, before we get to circle number five, take a moment to consider the costs. If you want to get into the inner circle, stay and listen. If you don't want to, get out now. Well, nobody left then either. And so the fifth circle, they're in the middle of understanding total reality, understanding the gospel. And the center circle is the moment of choosing. 
It's not another thing to know. It's not another thing to do. It's simply deciding which way you're going to go. You are ready to make the decision. You have knowledge of God. You understand repentance means turn away completely, turn to something completely different. You understand what it means to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You've counted the cost, knowing it's everything or nothing. And if it's nothing, then it's eternity in hell. And if you still proceed to the center circle, then you need to make a choice. Verse 19, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessing and curse. Therefore, choose life that you and your offspring may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying His voice, holding fast to Him, for He is your life and length of days, that you may dwell in the land that the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob to give them. It's the moment of choosing. It's a typical Moses plea. It's a strong plea. It's one from his very hearts for the nation of Israel. He's led them for 40 years. He knows they're stubborn. He knows they're stiff-necked. He knows they will not obey the Lord. They won't remain faithful. And so it's his plea from within his heart to choose wisely. And to make you realize this is not just a raising your hand, coming to the front, handing in a card at the back. He says, the witnesses here are, are not the people watching you today. The witnesses here are the two things who on the day of judgment will stand up and say, um, the heavens will say, yes, the, he, he was under the blue sky. I saw everything that happened. He definitely decided that that day. And the earth will say, yes, he was standing on me when he did that. Um, and he lived his life that way. And I can tell you, when he walked to that part of my, of, of, of my surface, he actually denied you altogether. When he walked to that side, he again claimed to be a Christian. But then he went out to that, that part of my surface. You, you understand what's happening here? I call heaven and earth to witness against you today, to stand up and say, we're taking note, whatever happens, we'll record for Judgment Day. I have set before you life and death. This decision is not one that you can can get wrong today in the sense of misunderstanding it and saying, well, I didn't really know what I decided that day. No, here it is, life or death. Which one are you going to choose? And literally in your mind now, you have to choose one. (laughs) Blessing and curse. Well, if you phrase it that one, it's obvious what you're going to choose, right? But remember, heaven and earth are witnessing. And you're going to go from here today. And you're going to walk under the heavens. And you're going to walk on the earth. You're going to live out your decision. Choose life then, Moses says. The obvious answer, really. Choose life. Choose the life of loving God. Choose the life of obeying God, not your own desires. Choose the life of holding fast to God. Choose the life of knowing things about God and not not being so ignorant. Don't die. Choose life. Life or death, blessing or curse, knowledge of God's Word or just being wise in your own eyes, repenting fully every time or just following your own way, loving God or loving yourself, loving God or loving the world, loving God or loving anything else, considering the costs or just kind of rushing along thinking you're just fine, I'm, do- I'm doing fine, I know what I'm doing. Note though, you don't have to choose life. You should, but you don't have to. But you must make a choice. What you do with God is the most important choice of your life, and you must choose. It appears that this speech by Moses, no surprise really, made a profound impact on Joshua. You remember Joshua? He's about 80 years old at this time. He's going to be Moses' successor, bringing the people over the Jordan. Because listen to what Joshua says many years later. In Joshua 24, verse 14 to 15, Joshua says, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and in faithfulness. And then he says this, And if it is evil for you to serve the Lord, then choose whom you want to serve. And then the famous part, but for me and my eyes, we will serve the Lord. Do you understand what he's doing, though? He's not just saying, uh, let, let's think of a, uh, something that could be on a plaque in Christian homes one day. Me and my eyes, we will serve the Lord above the mantle, above the, the main entrance. 
What he is saying is, serve the Lord in sincerity and in faithfulness, or say it is evil to serve the Lord. Those are your two choices. Serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness, but if it's evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, that's the other option, then choose whomever you want. But at least be willing to admit and say, I think it's evil to do everything God says. Because those are the only two options. Moses called the options life or death, blessing or curse. Joshua calls them, it is evil to serve the Lord, or I serve Him with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. Which will it be? Choose this day whom you will serve. Or as Moses said, choose life. Choose total truth on all of reality as presented in the gospel. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, this is such a, a striking passage. And Lord, for those of us who have submitted ourselves before you, oh Lord, this is, this is like a, a breath of fresh air all over again, reminding us of what you did when you circumcised our hearts, stripped away the sin and unbelief, the, the own ways, the wise in our own eyes, stripped it all away and replaced it with truth and knowledge and godliness and the work of the Spirit in our lives and, and forgiveness of sins and the hope of eternal life and the joy of Christian living and, and the excitement of coming together with others who are likewise changed by you. Lord, as we will even hear from testimonies in just a moment, you are the one who does that work in our hearts. Lord, thank you for giving us your word that we don't have to be ignorant. Lord, overcome the ignorance of our neighbors, our friends, our family with truth from your word. We ask for your blessing on this. We pray give us faithfulness as we live to the end of our lives, faithful to you. And then to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the eternal rest that awaits us. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.